So ladies and gentlemen, their colleagues, uh, apologies for the delay. We had some issues with Nicola Calcun, uh, who couldn't join us. So I'm replacing him. Uh, a warm welcome to this 26th edition of the Investment Management Forum of ECPAMA, the European Fund and Asset Management Association. I would have been pleased to welcome you in person, but obviously the present circumstances do not allow it. On behalf of ECPAMA, I would like to extend my warmest thanks to all the speakers and the panelists, special thanks to the representatives from the European Commission, the European Parliament, the German Presidency, Member States, ESMA, EOPA, IOSCO, and the NCAs for being with us today and tomorrow and for accepting to exchange views with the industry on topics that are critical to the sustainable development of our economy, the prosperity of Europe, and the well-being of its citizens. When we came up with the title for this event, we were hopeful that in November, we would have been dealing with the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. But this was without reckoning with the current second wave. However, we can still take stock of the reaction of the industry back in March, when thanks to the huge efforts of thousands of professionals, the entire industry went almost overnight to business continuity plans and working from home without significant disruptions in the service we provide to our clients, the end investors. The market turmoil of March 2020 led to heavy outflows, but these remained largely manageable and the existing regulatory framework and processes have proved their effectiveness. While we can take pride in the resilience of our industry and robustness of the regulatory framework, there can be no complacency. And we collectively need to draw lessons from this crisis and see what can be further improved in terms of risk management and supervision. The regulatory panel will address these topics tomorrow. I'm also looking forward to Stevens Mayor's speech tomorrow morning his last one at the Investment Management Forum in his capacity as chair of ESMA. And our vice president, Jaco Sehilla, will interview Paul Stevens tomorrow afternoon, president emeritus from ICI, who has now retired after more than 15 years at the organization. Do not miss these unique occasions. This crisis, in addition to having stress tested our funds, has also been an accelerator of some pre-existing trends. The increasing demand for ESG products, as well as the digitization and development of asset management industry in Asia. These and other trends will be debated by our panel of industry leaders later this morning. Exchanging ideas with industry peers, policymakers, and regulators is essential and represents the raison d'etre of this event, which aims at fostering mutual understanding between the private and the official sectors. Our top priority, after successful dealing with the health emergency, should be to recover from the unprecedented crisis caused by the pandemic. European institutions and member states have taken extraordinary steps to boost the economy. However, we cannot just rely on these measures, and it is now time to increase retail participation in capital markets in order to sustain the recovery and underpin the future growth over the long term. Let me share just a couple of data points from the recent EFAMA report on household participation in capital markets to illustrate the magnitude of the problem. More than 37% of European households financial assets are held in bank deposits. New money saved in deposit reached a total of 4.1 trillion euros during the 2008-2019 period. These figures are staggering and we can only welcome the Commission's renewed CMU action plan aiming at making Europe an even safer place for individuals to save and invest long term. Our retail CMU panel will look into those issues and reflect on how to foster investor confidence and provide for an adequate 
retirement income. Two fundamental aspects to unlock the potential of long-term investment. If anything, COVID-19 is a shocking reminder of the need to take action to mitigate climate change and preserve the environment. Citizens around the globe are calling for such actions. And as Europeans, we should be proud of Europe's leadership in that space. We are most grateful to Florica Finkhoyer, the new Director General for Environment at the European Commission for having accepted to share her views on the topic with us today. Our industry has a key role to play in the development of more sustainable finance, and we should respond positively to the growing demand for sustainable or responsible investment solutions. Nevertheless, to unleash the full potential of sustainable finance, we need reliable and verifiable ESG data to be made available by issuers. Such disclosures are currently patchy and inconsistent, if at all available. The panel moderated by Olivier Carré will focus on what ESG data is needed and how the upcoming NFRD review could help close the data gap and avoid undermining the competitive advantages Europe has gained in this area. Talking about competitiveness, it is one of our priority objectives to work with the EU institutions to create a regulatory framework that is not only sound, but also ensures that our industry remains competitive on the global stage. As an industry, we have the responsibility to innovate and design investment solutions that help meet the social and environmental challenges we are confronted with, while maximizing the long-term rate of return for investors. This requires a regulatory framework that is enabling and properly calibrated. The U6 and AFMD directives have become global gold standards and must remain so. This raises the question whether the current range of EU fund vehicles remains adequate to meet investors' needs, a very timely issue which will be debated today after lunchtime. And linking us back to the global stage will be the session organized on Friday late afternoon which will be looking at recent regulatory developments in the US. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, this crisis is affecting all sectors of our lives. And as industry leaders, legislators, and regulators, it is our joint responsibility to help achieve a swift, sustainable, and long-lasting recovery. I hope our debates will help forge such a sense of shared social responsibility and will contribute to finding solutions to the challenges ahead. This event would not have been made possible without the generous support of our sponsors, namely PwC, Tandriam, Arendt, and Amundi. We are most grateful to all of them. Conscious of time, I will now hand over to Dr. York Cookies. Dr. Cookies really needs no further introduction to our audience today. He is a highly regarded state secretary at the German Ministry of Finance with an impressive career in the financial industry behind him. He's also known as a fervent supporter of the Capital Markets Union project and is the architect of the successful German presidency as far as financial services are concerned. Dr. Cookies has accepted to take a few questions at the end of his address. For all the journalists in the audience, do not forget you can ask questions via the chat function for all the sessions. Dr. Cookies, the floor is yours. Thank you. And, um, and I will try to keep it to 15 minutes so that we have time for some questions. So um, obviously the, the priorities of our presidency have shifted quite massively. Um, everything we planned um, in January when we started thinking about priorities for the presidency of course, uh, had to undergo a very, uh, very fundamental uh, review and change um, once the pandemic struck um, in February and March. Um, and uh, I think we, we uh, really reacted quickly. And I think uh, capital markets um, um, response to, to the action taken um, shows that uh, markets um, have high trust and high, um, high esteem for how the European Union has, uh, has reacted starting in April with the response by the um, finance ministers 
um, on the ESM program, the EIB program, and the Commission program, SURE, which is now um, um, launching and uh, through several bond issuances has already shown that the concept of a European safe asset um, is alive and kicking. And uh, given the amount of issuance uh, being done and the huge investor response to that issuance, um, is uh, is a testimony that uh, that the European issuance process uh, is is sort of a uh, um, additional benefit to all of these uh, instruments that we are coming up with at the moment. Um, of course, now we are very happy about uh, um, about the recent developments, um, both um, in terms of uh, the um, European Parliament um, and uh, the Council agreeing on um, on a rule of law standard. Um, the European Parliament and the Council. Um, agreeing on uh, the budget, namely the MFF and the Next Generation EU budget uh, facility, um, that really brings us much, much closer to our main objective of this presidency, namely to get funds flowing as quickly as we can and as early in 21 as possible. That really is the, the um, um, point that launched to the um, top of our agenda list uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I'm also very happy that uh, the EU Parliament um, this week um, finalized its, uh, its position on the recovery and resilience facility that is the core component of next generation EU um, and, uh, and will be the, 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 uh, the center of the spending program to fight the crisis at the European level, um, which as I said, I think is the key difference in Europe's response um, in, to this crisis uh, relative to Europe's somewhat disjointed response to the global financial crisis in 08, 09. So I think um, we can be optimistic that we will get there. Of course, there's still quite a lot of uh, ground to be covered. Um, as you've seen, the position of the European Parliament uh, does differ quite, uh, quite a lot from that taken by um, leaders and the Council on the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Uh, but um, you know, right after the EP uh, pronounced its views, we started um, um, initiating the, the dialogue and working um, to, uh, to uh, get the trilogue started, um, which we hope um, to be able to finish uh, by December um, and uh, to, get to, to get that rolling as well. And of course, then the big other topic that we need to get, uh, get across the finishing line is the own resources decision. I think that uh, that is core um, on the one side, of course, to get funds rolling in 21. Um, we need to find agreement so that the national ratification processes can start. Um, but um, of course, also um, it's an impo important point um, that because quite a lot of member states are linking uh, the agreement with that to agreement on rule of law, um, which is something I'm much less expert in, but uh, th there is a political linkage between those two files. Um, so it has to be recognized uh, that, uh, that those two um, issues are interlinked. On own resources, I think the other uh, very big development um, that we saw in the agreement between council and the European Parliament is an agreement on a, uh, on a roadmap towards future introduction of own resources for the European Union. That is, I think, uh, um, cannot be rated highly enough in terms of the importance of uh, what we are doing right now <clears throat> with reforms to the uh, future deeper integration of the European Union. So I think that's also sort of a, one of these collateral benefits of our joint response that, uh, that uh, we are coming up now with uh, ideas on own resources for the EU that uh, many would have thought impossible um, um, a few years ago or even a few months ago. So in that sense, I think um, the budgetary fiscal policy response is on track. Of course, still quite a lot of uh, ground to be covered, but uh, we are very optimistic and massively focused to get things done um, by the end of this year so that funds can flow as early as possible as next year. I think that's the key, that's the key insight that we have. Um, you spoke about um, CMU, and I want to talk about that, of course, as one of the key topics um, next to the, um, in my view, um, um, sister projects of banking union and digital union, and of course, encompassing the important uh, project of sustainable finance and the fight against uh, money laundering and terror finance in the European Union. Um, I think the, the progress that we're making on CMU is quite substantial. Um, we, uh, we um, together with uh, France and the Netherlands, initiated the initiative of Next CMU. Um, the Commission 
published, um, um, and the, the group that you spoke of, the, the high-level group, um, published a very, very good um, 120 pages of uh, proposals. The Commission has turned that into um, specific proposals, um, uh, way more than a dozen, and I think that's exactly the way we have to go. Um, we prioritized this uh, topic in our presidency. Um, we foresaw it to be prioritized. We will continue to prioritize it. And, um, and I think um, it's important that, uh, that we move on and, uh, and really get some, some things going. And of course, you mentioned the, the, some of the core issues uh, that we have. We need incentives for long-term investments. We need incentives for our pension and insurance um, industries to provide products um, in this low, rate, uh, low interest rate environment that will secure pensions and that will give an add-on to the uh, state-run pension systems and that will provide additional pillars um, and that um, that uh, that um, uh, reflect the positive success you called USITS, the global gold standards for the fund management industry. Um, my dream is that a PEP at some point becomes the global gold standards for pension and insurance products. I think uh, with the pan-European pension uh, product, we have a good architecture in place. We are working on implementation now. Um, we are actually working in Germany um, also to, to see how we can incentivize uh, these, these ideas from a tax perspective. Um, and I think that um, is the a very strong linkage between the insurance industry and the fund management industry where, um, where a lot of uh, positive um, collateral benefit can be achieved. Um, if this CMU goal of, uh, of growing long-term investments for private individuals um, succeeds, then uh, capital markets can really grow and prosper. I uh, spent a lot of time in my life in the US, um, and if you see how important 401k and other um, products are for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the size of the US capital markets, I think it's uh, very clear uh, where Europe um, is, is behind. And I think that's, uh, that's something that we urgently have to catch up on. The other big topic where Europe is behind, you named it, um, is uh, retail investor participation um, in capital markets. And um, as you know, I'm a big, big supporter of the idea um, that um, specifically with MIFID, we have to be brave enough to, um, to make some revisions to the MIFID standard, uh, because in some of those areas where retail participation in capital markets is at stake, um, clearly um, we've seen empirical evidence um, in a very comprehensive um, a survey that we did of investors, um, consumer protection groups, um, uh, product providers, that, uh, that the rules um, and the stringency of, uh, of uh, information requirements um, in MIFID, even for very simple products, um, um, I would only name corporate bonds um, with make whole clauses as my favorite example, has led to a substantial decline in the provision of, uh, of corporate bonds in retail tradable size. In fact, uh, one of our biggest uh, um, retail um, focused um, exchanges did a survey and found that since the introduction um, of these rules, um, about uh, two thirds to 70% of bonds have increased in, uh, in their nominal um, sizes to a degree um, to A, avoid the uh, PREPS kit rules, um, but B, um, with the norms of uh, 100K, uh, make it impossible for retail to participate. So I think um, it sounds like a minute detail, but it's extremely important. Um, as you say, that, uh, that if we want CMU to grow and prosper, we also have to uh, think hard about where in MIFID we have to find um, um, modifications to allow this participation um, um, to really happen. With the capital markets recovery program, um, we've um, planned, we've, uh, we've started. I think it's extremely encouraging that the commission um, has launched this, uh, this process. Um, we, as, uh, as the presidency, have pushed it forward. We are <laughs> working closely now with the European Parliament um, to, to um, hopefully get the trilogue done this year so that we can make progress in this uh, very important topic as well. I think the other issues um, will be reserved for the um, big MIFID review, which is also extremely important in the context of CMU. A lot of the market microstructure pro questions that are, that are open, a lot of the um, questions around a stronger participation of uh, private investors um, um, in, in um, capital markets across Europe. A lot of the issues around overcoming fragmentation and segmentation, I think, are issues that really need to be addressed um, in, the, in the current years. And we're very, very positive that the Commission in its uh, CMU program 
has really shown the way um, to uh, forward on, um, on a lot of these issues. Um, also in the context, of course, um, of, um, of, um, of thinking about um, how to strengthen equity participation. Um, I think uh, we've seen quite a lot of encouragement that uh, both in terms of promoting um, startup investing to um, promoting investment into listed companies, uh, the commission has very, very strong ideas, uh, very strong focus, and we really support that. Um, and you'll see in the council conclusions that we're planning on CMU, which will summarize the position of the council going into 21, um, that uh, we want to be extremely ambitious on these things and we, we really want to be on the front foot of, um, of these initiatives. Um, let me come to a um, topic that of course for Germany is difficult, but, uh, but important to fix. Um, namely, what are the capital markets uh, uh, conclusions that we draw from the current scandal around uh, Wirecard? I think it's extremely important that we find the appropriate response. Um, um, I spent many, many hours this weekend reading the ESMA report on, um, on ESMA's view, for which we're very, very grateful um, that um, ESMA went through such a quick and a thorough and comprehensive um, investigation of uh, what uh, is going, what went wrong. Um, and um, um, we, we really agree with the vast majority of the conclusions. Um, in fact, we have already proposed legislation um, that is currently being finalized in the German government um, that addresses quite a few of the issues named by ESMAs as deficiencies. Uh, the most important one of which um, I believe is to strengthen our supervisory authorities um, when it comes to um, the enforcement of financial information. That, of course, is the lifeblood of capital markets. Um, and I think it's extremely important um, that, uh, that we fix the issues that we saw um, that uh, our supervisory authority, BaFin, um, gets the, um, the um, authority and the powers if it detects um, suspicion of fraud to actually intervene to use um, sovereign powers to investigate, to, um, to use forensic powers to investigate. Um, and I think everyone um, who, is, um, who has analyzed the uh, draft legislation that we have um, sees that we're extremely serious about, uh, about uh, moving, um, moving ahead on this and uh, really setting a standard um, in Europe uh, for, the, for the possibility to, de to detect fraud. We are also going through um, where um, we think, um, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, um, Germany was too generous in granting um, using, using, using national discretions on the topics of um, audit. Um, um, we propose to shorten the maximum audit span to 10 years, which um, um, Germany um, used an exemption or an, an option in the European legislation. Uh, we're looking to, uh, to go back to 10 years. Um, we want to um, substantially increase the liability um, responsibility of auditors, um, and we want to make sure that we fully comply with the European standards on the separation of audit um, and, um, and um, other advisory functions. So um, and that's just a quick run through, and there's many, many other aspects of our legislation uh, where I don't have the time to go into the details, but Trust me, um, if I had the time, um, you would hear many more um, um, specific and concrete responses that we have to make sure that we have the appropriate response to this uh, very uh, severe uh, um, um, issue with, the, um, with our capital markets uh, in order to make sure that trust in our capital market is re retained. Um, very quickly on banking union and digital union, um, I consciously prioritized CMU because you mentioned it, um, but I do believe that those um, topics are extremely complementary. Um, we can see with the outstanding legislative proposals and strategy papers that the Commission has published on digital union that there is a huge amount of intersection between the uh, topics uh, on crypto assets and the CMU project on uh, digital currency, on programmable currency, on, um, on um, safeguarding our systems um, against cyber attacks. Um, so I think the correlation between getting it right on digital union and, uh, and the capital markets union is very, very strong and very, very powerful. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, we are uh, working as hard as we can um, to turn what the commission published at the end of September on um, Mika, Dora, um, and the strategies on retail payments 
um, and, and on digital and into um, specific progress. And we really want to do our share that we hand over to our Portuguese friends, um, very well advanced dossiers on these topics. Um, the same goes for banking union. Um, of, of course, priorities shifted in the last eight months and we think it was absolutely correct that on banking, um, we focus completely on making sure that the transmission channel from the banking sector into the um, provision of loan lending to the real economy stays um, working and operational. We were very quick to respond with the CRR quick fix. We were very quick to respond with uh, um, facilitations on IFRS 9 and other um, accounting rules. So um, I think it was correct to reshift the priority from the planned debate around banking union and Basel III implementation to to making sure that uh, that uh, the um, that the banking sector doesn't um, doesn't uh, restrict credit access, um, and if you see how the combination of those uh, supervisory and regulatory measures, together with massive um, state guarantee programs for the provision of credit to the real economy, um, um, had a really really positive effect. I mean, give me one example where you are in a um, recession um, um, approaching the double digits and you see actually an expansion of credits to the real economy. I think uh, it'll be very challenging to find many examples of that, um, but uh, the European economy has really achieved that in Q3 and I think that's one of the big factors behind um, the more optimistic uh, numbers that we're seeing um, on growth relative to the initial projections. So I think that's extremely important, so it was the right thing to do, but um, we are working hard now in our presidency um, to, to uh, work on the, um, on the holistic approach to banking union. We need an internal market for the provision of banking services. Cross-border groups have to be much more uh, mobile with their capital and liquidity between um, member states in the European Union. Um, we need more risk reduction. And yes, we also need a solution for risk sharing. And uh, we made a proposal a year ago um, that we also can see as the German finance ministry us uh, making progress on European deposit insurance in the context of a holistic approach on the banking union. And I think that's also an important signal. Um, so that continues. Um, of course, it's not easy, but uh, we are making uh, strides and, uh, and um, we have a big debate and very important debate at the end of this month um, on the ESM reform and the introduction of the common backstop to the single resolution fund. I think for every investor, um, that's also extremely important. My last word will be on sustainable finance. Um, and of course, I could talk half an hour just on that topic. Uh, but uh, um, as presidency for us, um, we are seeing a lot of progress um, on the technical aspect, aspect of the taxonomy. I think it's extremely important uh, that that moves ahead. Um, on disclosure, we're seeing progress. Uh, th those are very important things. Um, so in that sense, uh, we're, we are moving ahead on that topic. Um, we just reached council conclusions on another sister project that's intimately related to banking and capital markets union, namely um, the fight against money laundering um, and are uh, looking forward to more, um, more regulation um, and, and harmonization um, on that topic um, um, with a uh, move from the current directive scheme to regulation scheme, um, more concentration on a single supervisor. I think that's also a very important aspect of moving away from our fragmented state of capital markets um, to a more unified state. Um, on sustainable finance, my very final word will be to thank um, all of you um, to, uh, for the massive participation in Green Bunds. Um, um, as you know, we launched that with a 10-year and five-year issuance this year. Yes, we were late to the game, but I think uh, we showed that with our um, innovative um, concept of, um, of the twin bonds uh, that assure liquidity and a commitment to green finance, uh, we, uh, we attracted quite a lot of um, demand and quite a lot of interest. So many, many thanks to all of you who participated in that and who supported us with that. It's an extremely important concept for us in the context of sustainable finance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jörg Kupis, for your always insightful views. Uh, also, your candid views on the Wirecard case. We have received quite a few questions, but you know, conscious of time, let me just uh, select three of them. Uh, they all relate either to CMU or to MIFID. Uh, on CMU, the question is the following. Among the 16 set of actions highlighted in the Commission's action plan, which ones do you think deserve to be treated as a matter of priority? Now, I think that this is discussed at the member states level. You are trying with the FSC and the ECOTIN to 
kind of give a sense of clarity among all these 16 actions. So that's the first question. The second question concerns MIFID and data costs. Let me read it out to you. Asset managers are among the biggest users of data, market data, index data, ESG data. Over time, we have witnessed a sharp increase in the cost of those data, to the extent that it has become a cause of serious concern for our industry, but also for other market participants. Experience in the US shows that the creation of a consolidated state is welcome, but not sufficient to address the market data cost issue. What is your view on that, on market data cost? And finally, question from Carolano, who is saying, thank you for an interesting speech. Germany was in favor of the review quick fix of MIFID. Was this not premature and counterproductive? Sorry, what was the last, I didn't catch the, la the last part of the uh, question on MIFID quick fix. Yeah, so Germany was in favor of the quick fix review of MIFID. Was this not premature and or counterproductive? Yeah, um, maybe let me start with that um, because I, 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 I think the verdict is still out because it depends completely on, on the result. Uh, but uh, but I think it's it's it it can't be fixed soon enough because especially the topic that I mentioned um, and that is part of the quick fix or the uh, capital markets uh, recovery plan. Um, I think we can't wait for years and years and years. We have all the empirical evidence that uh, that there are counterproductive effects um, on the participation of retail investors in capital markets. Um, and and I, I firmly believe that it was a good idea that the commission came out with its proposal. Um, we'll see what, uh, what comes out of it and, uh, and how far we can go. Um, and everything we're doing right now with the quick fix um, or the recovery plan, um, as it's correctly called, um, is, doesn't in any way sense or form um, contradict, contradict or um, contravene um, what the comprehensive MIFID review will bring. So in that sense, I think it, it was the right thing to do to see that we, um, in addition to the um, measures that we took in the banking sector, are also willing and able to act quickly on capital markets. And I also think that the um, sister projects uh, to the MIFID um, 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 ideas that we have on securitization and uh, and uh, prospectus are extremely important. Um, I think uh, that will be another one of these topics that I didn't discuss, but uh, I'll uh, lead over to priorities. Um, you know, if if we if. And again, uh, you know, the, the, the correlation between CMU and banking union couldn't be clearer um, um, on, uh, than on um, securitization, right? I mean, we've established a very, very good um, framework that sets the right incentives, that avoids all of the negative um, um, connotation of securitization from the financial crisis with the STS framework, but yet we're seeing that it's being used far too, uh, to a far too low extent. And I think the measures in the um, recovery package from uh, NPL securitization um, and, um, and all of the specifics that we have um, on that um, show that it's the right thing to address that. And to me, um, you know, things in Europe always take very, very long due to the um, governance aspects and the trilogues and everything. So to me, things move rather too slowly. And um, um, I, I will gladly take the criticism that uh, we move too quickly. Um, so in that sense, I, I would say um, balanced approach. On market data, um, I think that's the big question for, for the um, for the big review. Um, I mean, as you saw in our um, in one of our two non-papers on our MIFID consultation, um, what you're saying is a view shared by many that we consulted. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, in, in an area where margins are compressing, where um, prices um, and uh, execution prices are becoming a more and more important um, aspect of overall cost, um, I think it's extremely important that we address those topics. And, uh, and we made it very clear that for us, uh, market data cost is, is front, uh, front and center in the, in the problem zone of where Europe needs to catch up to other regions of the world. Um, and, um, and the debate around consolidated tape, I think, is a fair one. Um, of course, we have to uh, be very thoughtful and mindful of pros and cons. 
uh, but uh, but it is something that uh, that we think we needs to be addressed in the context of CMU as uh, as one of the priorities. Um, so I keep uh, that's why I consciously uh, tackled the questions from the back to the front because uh, it in implicitly gives some of the priorities on CMU. Um, and, uh, and those topics, I think, uh, of market microstructure are enormously important. Also, um, we have to find the response to, um, to what it means that the largest capital market of the European Union is leaving the European Union. Um, so that brings up a lot of questions on clearing, a lot of questions on um, STOs, DTOs, and uh, those have to be addressed um, very thoughtfully. And, uh, and we've, uh, we've made some proposals <clears throat> and um, and our in intense discussion with the commission, with ESMA, and um, and everyone on that. So that's uh, that I would include in my priority list. Otherwise, on the big topics of CMU, I really um, I can only stress um, how important to me uh, this whole topic of um, of um, long term investments is, and that of course links very closely to what we thought we may have at the end of our presidency. Um, namely, um, a launch into the um, the um, debate around um, solvency two. Um, of course, through the delays, that won't happen. Uh, but um, you know, finding a framework how um, insurance companies can be mobilized, how pension funds can be mobilized um, to to uh, provide long term capital, um, to diversify their holdings, to think about how we can encourage stronger participation in equity markets. I think is is absolutely at the epicenter of of the discussion. You know, we can't constantly um, complain that Europe doesn't have um, the Amazons and Facebooks and Googles um, um, of this world, uh, but yet um, um, be complacent and live with a financing structure that um, is majority bank debt and has so small market caps um, in equity markets relative to the sizes of our economy. Um, if that doesn't change, my my th theory is. Um, that uh, business models that by nature have to rely on equity rather than debt um, to fund themselves, um, Europe simply won't catch up. Right? So I think that's, that's really um, absolutely um, at the center and the core um, of what we're thinking of um, when, we, when we want to address CMU and uh, move forward. Um, I think um, we, we somewhat changed our tone um, when we took office um, on supervisory con convergence and harmonization. Um, and I think um, everyone saw that the German position um, from the Meseberg agreement that we had with France, um, then into going into the um, um, the ESA review, um, we really wanted that to succeed. And I think um, um, whenever I hear oh, we just finished the ESA review, don't touch it, um, I think is wrong. We have to think constantly about uh, the right balance between national um, rule, um, competent authorities and the and the European. Um, um, authorities, and if uh, if anything, um, you know, I keep seeing evidence uh, that we have to strengthen the European supervisory powers, um, be it banking, be it insurance, be it um, be it securities markets, and um, um, I think everyone noticed also going back to our um, painful um, wire card experience, um, we do want to uh, think very constructively and uh, creatively about um, what uh, part of that is uh, is due to national deficiencies and what we can do. To, um, to solidify a European um, oversight. And I think the, the fact that we want to respond very constructively to um, the European supervisory response uh, to, our, to our issue um, also shows that uh, we have a very pro-European approach in this, um, in this response. Thank you very much, Jörg. Uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time. So I would like to thank you for your participation in this event and also for championing the CMU project as you do and also for your drive all the best for the remainder of your successful presidency of the council and we look forward to continuing our dialogue with you and the bmf into 2021 thank you thank you bye so allow me now to introduce our next keynote speaker sarika fing hoyer director general for the environment at the european commission sarika we are very honored to have you here as you know, I hope our members are very active in the ESG space. They actively contribute to the dialogue in the EU, showing a strong commitment to the objective of mainstreaming sustainability in the financial sector. But this is not just about sustainable finance. There are, there are higher stakes to consider, which require the integration of sustainability 
in the European economy as a whole. The Directorate General for the Environment plays a key role in shaping policy to achieve these objectives, and the EU in turn is a front runner at international level. The European Commission has set the bar very high for the next years, starting with a renewed commitment to the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement and the adoption of a very ambitious European Green Deal. The fallout from the pandemic has strengthened the urgency to mobilize all available forces towards a sustainable recovery. Environmental, social, and governance challenges are becoming ever more evident at global level, and in particular in Europe. And we must all contribute to finding solutions. Making responsible investment mainstream means that active choices need to be made at all levels of the value chain, from end investors and asset managers up to company boards. Our audience would usually value hearing your views on sustainability, the role and ambition of the EU in that space, the challenges faced, and how our industry can and indeed must help. Florica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tanguy. And uh, actually, good morning. And thank you very much for having me. I think the very fact that um, I'm a speaker at your event is quite telling and unfortunately also shows that we are in a very changed uh, system now. And the pandemic has hit us hard and the um, economy has been uh, slowing down on it. Uh, and we all know, we, we just looked at our economic um, autumn forecast for, uh, for this year, and we saw that we went down in uh, the fourth quarter now, although we were just on the upswing in the third. So we will have an outlook which is more relatively positive in the sense that we know that we will regain uh, 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 you know, pace in, in 21. Um, but it will take two years at least until we get uh, to the pre-pandemic level. And in this context, of course, the EU recovery plan uh, is very crucial. And I really think I'm now picking up where Dr. Cookie left it by uh, turning to sustainable uh, finance and the long-term uh, investment uh, opportunities. We have to brace for slow recovery. And we do know that the public stimulus that we are now uh, um, projecting is really not enough. We really need the private market. So that's why I'm very happy to be able to speak to you today because we need you to engage in sustainable um, recovery. Well, the good news for us, but also for you is that sustainable finance is no longer a, a niche market. It is uh, quite common now. And my main message to you is actually the following. The EU, the union, aims to be and to remain really the global leader on sustainable finance. And sustainability should be really the hallmark of uh, the European finance. At the same time, it's clear we cannot do this alone. We have to, uh, have to operate in, in concert at the international level. And that's why actually uh, the EU launched the international platform on sustainable finance in March last year. Now, but when we look at the, at the situation, already in January 2020, the World Economic Forum, the Global Risk Report, found that the top five, five global risk, global risk in terms of likelihood and impact, they were all environmental. Uh, you know, we all know it, extreme weather events, climate change, human-made ecological disasters, major, major biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapses and natural disasters, all environmental risk. And these risks obviously are also risk to business and to stock market. And you know that today half of the world's GDP is actually highly or moderately dependent on Earth's natural capital, which however is uh, disappearing if we do not invest in it. So in this context, the sustainable finance is really becoming the tool and also with the uh, Recover and Resilience Fund and the green bonds, you had just heard it from, from Dr. Cookies, the massive investments that are coming to Europe is actually should be our silver lining. And this is our path for recovery. And a large part of this recovery has to be green and based on natural capital. 
So um, today is uh, your session is about lessons learned. And one uh, important lesson is already that those uh, uh, companies that in the COVID crisis focused on climate change or environmental, social and governance considerations uh, were better off. And why is it? Because in one word, it's about resilience. The companies that generally address, let's say, social, environmental uh, and governance risk in and integrate these impacts in the management of uh, the core business models and strategies are just more likely to succeed long term because they do deliver then uh, so sort of sure returns to uh, stakeholders and, 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 and uh, shareholders, be it the employees, the customers, the suppliers, the environment, and also the wider society. Now, Therefore, it is probably really not uh, unsurprising that the green bonds market has really grown so rapidly in the recent years. Actually, there's more divest investor in demand uh, than there are enough green bonds, right? Uh, and the, the market is also evolving quite rapidly into wider systems of sustainable debt, rising insurance of social bonds, as well as pandemic bonds actually this year. Now, the question was already put, are we moving fast enough to finding the transition to a green and resilient, and for us, it should also be an inclusive uh, economy. Now, the total investment needs uh, are, that we need are reach, um, to reach all the goals that we have in, in, in place or in mind in 2030 on climate and environmental uh, policy goals are estimated at around 470 billion euro per year. And this covers uh, the current uh, 2030 climate and energy targets, but also investments to deliver on the wider transport infrastructure, right, in, 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 in clean uh, transport infrastructure, and to meet also the environmental objectives in clean water, clean air, and so forth. And all these investment needs clearly go beyond uh, the means of public sector budgets. And therefore, we need really you, the private sector, to come because you're critical for the successful transition. Now, the question is, how do we get there? What would be the ingredients needed to attract the private financing so as to fund also the green recovery? I would like to mention four elements, perhaps also four, uh, five, not five elements, and also five incentives. Um, or at least uh, perhaps uh, arguments to, to go into the green recovery. Now, the first is that the vision which is enshrined in the European Green Deal is actually very clear. And investors do know the long-term objectives and the pathways of the transition because most of them are actually defined by law. Take, for instance, the uh, EU commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050 or the minus 55% of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, or we just had also issued a new biodiversity strategy with, which addresses the other major environmental crisis, in particular the loss of biodiversity. And then we also do have at the heart of the Recovery and Resilience Fund, we also have the principle of do no harm to the environment. That means that the investments that will be made by member states as part of this Recovery and Resilience Plan must all avoid causing significant harm to the EU's climate or, poly or, or environmental policy objectives. For instance, if you invest in climate infrastructure, it must not destroy biodiversity or increase uh, or water or air pollution. What I want to say with that is you have predictability because there is a clear regulatory framework and that gives clarity. Now, the second element, which uh, should be important uh, for the private market, is the Commission has announced now quite a big package, 750 billion euros for the recovery and resilience effort through the next generation EU. Uh, and there, 37% uh, shall be linked really to uh, green uh, um, and uh, environmental and climate objectives. Now, part of that is uh, also to be part of the 30% of the next generation EU uh, will be raised uh, through uh, the market, through green bonds. And that's around 250 billion. 
And that makes the EU the biggest global issue of green bonds. So next to what I just said on predictability, the regulatory framework, you also have an unprecedented business opportunity, right? So this alone should also be enough, but there is also another factor which we have to look at, and that is the policy framework. Policy framework on the EU level, but also in member states. Um, and indeed, for us, from the European side, uh, from the Commission side, the sustainable finance is actually a key priority, uh, which is incorporated in all aspects uh, of policy, and especially in the financial sector and beyond. So normally you have my colleagues from FISMA speaking to you, and they would speak about assets management, insurance, prudential requirements, corporate governments, credit rating, accounting, or consumer, consumer protection. But in all these areas, the Commission now is developing a very comprehensive approach to sustainable finance. And also, I think we cannot talk about sustainable finance without mentioning taxonomy regulation. It was already just mentioned by Dr. Cookies. Indeed, it is actually the, 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 fir the first ever classification system in the world of environmentally sustainable economic activities. And that will give a real boost to sustainable investment because it does provide the basis for the green bond standards, for the eco labels, for retail financial products and green mortgages, and it helps banks, insurers, pension funds, investment funds like you to and identify which activities and which investments are sustainable. But also from our side, we would like to avoid the greenwashing, right? Now you will also have a uh, renewed sustainable finance strategy, which is scheduled uh, for adoption in the beginning of next year. And this renewed strategy will be quite ambitious and will build obviously on the achievements so far, but also explain, explore new areas to mainstream sustainability in the financial and uh, corporate sectors. As you might have heard, also the Commission is also currently working on a proposal to update the non-financial reporting directive. It's also part of the Green Deal. And this uh, revision of this directive is actually very critical to the success uh, of key parts of the sustainable finance agenda. Because by improving the sustain sustainability risks so the dependencies and the footprint impacts and the performance and the governance information that companies have to report on, uh, it will enable investors like you and asset managers like you to better understand the sustainability risk, but also the opportunities. So this is also uh, quite important. So there's a wider policy framework, not just the regulatory framework, the funding, but also a wider policy framework. And now I would like to come to the fourth element, and that is perhaps the most actually difficult one. It's a wider reform agenda. And I, I just heard with Dr. Cookie saying in one word, taxation. Uh, well, he, he referred uh, to the plastic tax, but for us, it's also quite important that we get the price signals right. And the price signals will get right through well-designed, um, actually, and socially fair and environmental taxation. So moving a little bit from uh, labor to tax pollution, and that is a much wider, wider issue. But it's something which is important to be addressed because otherwise we have a distortion of the market signals. And we really need to build on a system where the negative externalities of doing business are not longer ignored. I mean, we have to look at it. And where sustainable uh, investments should not be subject to unfair competition compared to, for instance, the brown sector. So this is a much wider and probably the most difficult sector. Then I come to the last fifth element, and that is, of course, the global dimension. And um, here I would like to refer again back uh, because this is the aim of the International Platform on Sustainable Finance. We really need to seek global coherence and transparency on sustainable finance worldwide. Now, you as invest the investment management industry, you have actually the tools to act. You have the profit perspective, you have the funding, and I do think believe also the willingness to be part of this change. And so to bridge now between capital and green. And of course, the banking sector also has to play a very vital role because they have to scale up the finance 
to the levels that we all need in order to go to this green transition. So I just want to conclude with one remark. Yes, climate and environmental crisis are the defining challenges of our time. They're not going away. But by putting the Green Deal at the center of our recovery, we do now have a game changer for moving forward to a sustainable, carbon neutral, regenerative economy. And in our view, it should be an economy that gives more back to the planet that it takes. And I would leave you with a question because if growth through investment in green and nature-based sustainable capital, not more interesting in the long term, in the long run for business, than growth that is dependent only on disposable capital. So that I leave you with, and I would like to thank you for having invited me to bring back also to you this idea of the sustainable finance and what it means from the position of uh, DJ Environment, but also the commission at large. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorica, for your inspiring speech and informed views. Your busy agenda does not allow you to stay any longer. So on behalf of the European Investment Management Industry, let me wish you every success in your new role, such an important role that you have here. So you can rely on us to play our part and do what we can to help you achieve the Commission's environmental objectives mm -hmm. to which we very much subscribe. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So we will now have a short break before the CEO panel starts at 11.25 Brussels time. In the meantime, we will conduct a little poll to introduce the panel discussion. So we would be most grateful if you could answer the poll questions now. The poll will appear on the right side of your screen, just next to the chat under the poll tab. So again, please kindly take the time now to answer those questions, and we shall discuss your reactions with our CEO panel at 11.25. Thank you very much.